praise at the praise to Lord Manjunath Swami, my Honorable Chancellors, Pujeshi Dr. Virendra Ekdeji, Honorable Vice Chancellor Dr. Niranjan Kumar, Executive Director and Member Board of Governance Srimati Padmalata Niranjan Kumar, Director of Administration Sri Saket Shetty, Pro Vice Chancellors Dr. S.K. Joshi, Sri Jivendra Kumar, Registrar Dr. Colonel U.S. Dinesh, Deputy Registrar Dr. Ajanta G.S. and Principal Dr. Sunil K.M. Before I start, I would like to take you to the journey of my campus, where I work. We have a beautiful campus. which includes SDA Medical College. We have big hospitals which include specialities and super specialities. We have a big libraries which is medical, physiotherapy, nursing with different varieties of books and journals which are recent. It's the Department of Physiotherapy. We work in the different areas, pediatric, OPD based interventions, treadmill based interventions. We conduct a lot of workshops, hand injuries, and we do conduct a lot of camps at the community level. That's where I work, that's SGM College of Physiotherapy. Now, we are at 12,704 km. A couple of years or a couple of decades back, if somebody would have told me that we will be able to see each other or talk with each other, they would have definitely told, are you kidding me? Yeah, that would have been a question. But now we know that we can talk at 12,000 km also and we can see each other. Similarly, therapist has thought that rehab exercises for children with cerebral palsy is fun is a question mark. And when I say that it's fun, they think that I am kidding. So what I will say is that you laugh because you think I am kidding. And I do laugh because I think I am not kidding. And my consecutive slides will prove whether the rehab exercises are fun for children or not fun for the children. So these are my authors, Dr. Tony, myself, Anuprita, Kavisha, and my co-authors, my postgraduate students from 2014 to 2019 batch. This brief about me. I completed my undergraduation from Manipal University. Then my post-graduation from Rajiv Gandhi University in SDM College of Physiotherapy and post-doctorate from University of Manitoba. I have few awards on my name and couple of courses I completed in NDT, Sensory Integrations, Aquatic, Craniosacral Therapy, Yoga Therapy and couple of memberships on my name. If you ask my routine, I am a teacher which teaches to the undergraduate as well as to the postgraduate students and I basically teach them exercise therapy, that's kinesiology and physiotherapy in neurology and physiotherapy in pediatrics. I do have certain responsibilities along with this is I am intern coordinator in ABH, I am member for the PhD committee, academic council and subject expert. As a clinician, if you look at the census, we see nearly 5000 patients in a year which includes the children with neurodevelopmental disorders in majority and also the children with cardiorespiratory dysfunctions, musculoskeletal dysfunctions. So we start working in an ICU. We have a fantastic pediatric medical unit which is governed by, which is headed by Dr. Vijay Kulkarni. And in an ICU we see nearly 6 to 8 cases and our major interventions are early intervention. We do have a PICU where we mainly look after the cardiorespiratory dysfunctions and try to stabilize these patients early and we start the developmental care in the initial stage itself. We do have a very good pediatric ward where the patients are entered with uh, acute illness and we take care of basically the chest care and the developmental care. We have a pediatric physiotherapy OPD which is managed by myself and my colleague Dr. Jyoti Jivannavar. We see in a day 30 to 40 patients and our major interventions include neurodevelopmental techniques, sensory integrations and computer game rehabilitations. Type of patients we see are neurodevelopmental disorders, musculoskeletal and majority of them with the syndromes. This is about my OPD, what we do in the OPD. So we give them on a vestibular ball based exercise interventions, trampoline based interventions, computer game based rehabilitations. 
we do go to the government orphan school and we treat the children with neurodevelopmental disorder there we go to the one of the exceptional children school that is usha school for exceptional children we have there nearly children 100 children in that particular school and majority of them are having a you know, neurodevelopmental disorders and having a mental retardation as one of the component along with the therapies what we incorporate into the pediatric opd in sdm we do have there associated with hydrotherapy and hypotherapy music therapy it's basically a multidisciplinary school which involves all these therapies there we do get a lot of references from the in and around the consultant who work in 60 to 100 kilometer areas and we give them the protocol for the interventions and they follow up with us in a monthly basis depending upon the distance the cases which can come to us and take the next protocol since the today's presentation is focusing towards the neurodevelopmental disorder and the majority of of the neurodevelopmental disorder is is a cerebral palsy so as we know that now there is a little increase into the inter, in, increase into the prevalence that is 2 to 4 per 1000 live births and if you take in a scenario in india there are 12 million children which are suffering from neurodevelopmental disorders of which 10% are from the hilly areas 13% are from the urban areas and 18% are from the rural areas with this i shift towards the next presentation that is the research studies i have 32 publications done a uh, few of them which i'll be touch upon today so couple of studies we done in the nicus so if you look at this particular study we studied basically the length of gastrocnemius and soleus muscle tendon in 120 infants and what it shows is that there is a muscle tendon unit length which is there is a significant difference between the preterm as well as the postterm children we did study on a single case studies in the beginning when we wanted to assess the applicability of the pdms2 so first study we conducted was on choreothetoid cerebral palsy and next study we conducted was on spastic diplegia we said that the pdms2 is applicable in children with disability and it can be used as one of the evaluation tool so these are the few graphs that it shows that the the question is showing poor or below average that means the children when you evaluate on pdms2 will give a low score so we developed we did in a longer study that is including 100 children and quantifying whether the pdms2 can quantify the gross motor developmental delay or not and it actually quantifies the gross motor developmental delay on our result it shows then we did couple of studies in a normal school where we studied the hypermobility between boys and girls and we try to find out what is the correlation for this hypermobility some contrasting results for us we had 5 to 15 percent documented in the literature whereas we got nearly 33.73 percent to 34.29 percent of children having hypermobility when we tried to find out what is the reason for it what is the correlation for it we found that that it was more prevalent underweight children so probably the underweight was one of the cause which we found for that we did a study in the children with mental retardation and we found in a 205 population that was a sample size we found that 78.46 percent children were actually underweight and not overweight and obese though there is a notion that children with mental retardation will be obese because of physical immobility but here we got little contrasting results here too another study we did it on a nocturnal neurosis first we developed the reliable and valid questionnaire between 6 to 15 years of children and later we studied the prevalence of nocturnal neurosis in 16 to 15 years what was surprising for us was the prevalence was 12.67 percent between 6 to 15 years but as the age increased the prevalence actually reduced and when we asked about whether the parents are aware and do they consider this as a major issue the parents awareness among them was hardly nearly 36 percentage so what we concluded from that that even the nocturnal neurosis has to be considered as an early intervention and not only the NDD is to be considered there are a couple of studies which are in progression for the publication one of the study which we done on taping there's a lot of talk about the taping so we did this study on taping where we used the way we took the children with neurodevelopmental disorder who had a pronated feet what we found is that it was a crossover trial what we found was there was no difference between a and b group but if you take it in a whole group that is taping as well as exercise it did show some changes in the intervention so probably we can say that 
dipping can be used as an adjunct in the therapy. So, if you look at all these things, we were doing a lot of neurodevelopmental based techniques, we were doing a lot of hypotherapy, we were doing a lot of hydrotherapy, but somewhere the major questions were coming was that it was difficult to engage the children with neurodevelopmental disorder. And a lot of therapists were saying that somewhere we get stuck with the child when we are treating them. That the hand function is not completely improved or the leg function is not completely improved. And very important was we were not able to keep their motivation. So that was the need for us to go in for an uh, innovation and definitely we needed something which is very cost effective. So that's where the collaboration came into the picture with the University of Manitoba and SDM University. Now you might ask me a question, why did you select computer game rehabilitation? The man behind this particular approach and the development is Dr. Tony. So we, if you look at the upper extremity treatment at present, what we are having is we have a lot of treatment which is showing to be effective, for example, constantinous movement therapy, bimanual intensive task therapy, and lots of therapies which are task repetitive therapies. And most of the commonest, if you look into your routine practice, is that what you do is a hand weight bearing. Now when you do a hand weight bearing, let us keep one thing in the mind that the hand is for the purpose of manipulation and not for weight bearing. Whereas the leg is for the purpose of weight bearing and locomotion and not for the purpose of manipulation. So we were missing somewhere a lot of manipulation and that's what CGR gives about. And similarly, when we walk, we do not only walk, we do a dual tasking there. So gait has a dual tasking component as well as the hand manipulation has a dual tasking component. That's what the CGR was giving and that's what influenced us to go ahead with this particular project. So you might ask me how it all started. It was just in a formal discussion with one of our ex-student, Dr. Anubrita, who came to us and just discussed the idea about this one and then we thought, yes, this is something different and we should try out for. And we went through this that we had a lots of Skype meetings, we had a lots of WhatsApp calls and we finalized the protocol. We took the ethical approvals and with all those things, we continued the data collection and then the statistical analysis and result. All this contained 1000 plus emails and 100 plus Skype calls and we prepared final manuscripts. We have three manuscripts published already into the index journal and five are into the preparation. So this internal collaboration which was between the University of Manitoba and University of Sri Dharmasala, we had a basic goal was to produce innovative and cost effective therapeutic approach to improve the outcomes for children with cerebral palsy and other neurodevelopmental disorders. This included 12 week research exchange with Anuprita Ganetkar and 8 week research exchange with Kavisha Mehta. Now what this tele rehab protocol was all about or rehabilitation protocol was all about. Now rehabilitation I say that is when I am using it in my therapy and tele rehabilitation when I say when I am it is using it in the patient when they can go to the home and do. So this particular thing has basically two components that's physical exercise space and digital game space or you can say that as an accommodative space. Now what happens in this is you can have an object whichever object you want or whichever object you use in your daily routines and you can decide the games which are available commercially choose them because they are the one which is going to enter into the cognitive space or through which you are going to enter into the cognitive space whereas this one is in a physical space. So these are the few examples of different objects what you can use. Now if you compare with the routine therapy, we do not use lot many objects. Probably we play with the children with one or two objects. But here we can use the objects which are required for their daily activities. One, two, we can use the object depending upon what is the starting point for emerging skill. And it is easy to eliminate the gravity. And definitely very important, it is reduces the need for robotic assisted devices. Let me point out here one thing is that no more a passive therapy is useful unless and until the therapy is active you cannot get the results and so this induces that activeness that cognitive space to be included with a motor space. So these are the again few examples of the objects which you can use and you can apply a mouse to that and you can manipulate the object that's what there are few examples of the same. This is what is showing an application of the mouse on various objects. So 
you can use any object which you want to be using and depending upon what function or what task you wanted to look for so this once you apply the object how we can use this as an assessment software what it does it it provides an objective outcome measure to track change detect problems and guide progression and provides timely feedback for child parent and therapist and helps in telemonitoring that's very important and you can have a long term goals to collect longitudinal electronic records to establish database and registry so basically it's going to help us to have a data which is electronically recorded and which can be saved electronically so there is an assessment module in the assessment module what you do is you try to play a, you try to fix the mouse onto the object and then play with the game and then you will see certain objects coming up your goal is to catch that object and not the distractor and then you produce a beautiful graph which is measured on the basis of success rate response time movement time movement accuracy and movement variation so here is an uh, exam here is that's how it looks like an assorted graph that is completely this how it will look like the graph is once you do the evaluation so here is an example of how you do without distractor so this is basically showing the settings of the game so it gives you the flexibility to select what kind of setting you want to do and that will decide what kind of precise movement you want to do and then you give the name to the file and then you play with the object now here there is no distractor the job is that you are supposed to catch the ball so the the, the patient will be moving the hand with the considering this is an object that's a ball and then once it's played for to game and then you get a graph which is measured based upon how it was that is movement accuracy what was the response time what was the onset of time that's all it that all the details of that it will be giving and then you can have without distractors and you can have with distractors so again here showing the same is you have on the settings once you fix up with the settings that is again what sensitivity you are keeping what is an amplitude you want in the movement how precise you want the movement how large you want the movement where exactly you want the movement whether you want the movement happening at the wrist whether you want the movement happening at the shoulder or whether you want the movement to be happening at the elbow so similar object now if you see there is a distractor okay or the object which is coming is in a different way and once the game is over you can see the graph so you can see the previous graph versus this so this was little haphazard as compared to the previous one because there was a distractor there similarly you can have a multiple distractors coming in so likewise you can assess the different ways and then you have a tracking mode in the tracking mode what you do is you try to use again similar way go for a setting file name and now what you do in this is you try to fix the mouse on your head and then you are playing with that so here is the object which is you are supposed to be going along with the objects so here do a lot of using on a visual vestibular activities that is head turning and along with that you are working on the visual movements also so that's about the visual tracking now what we discussed is how do we assess now when we treat we use these different commercial games which are available on bigfish.com and you can use these games having what therapeutic value you want it is not that you just pick up the any game and you can just start playing with that it all depends upon what game you want and what is the function you want so that's why this picture is that you should be knowing what cognitive function you are looking for what movement you are looking for depending upon that you select the game so here is one of the example of aqua ball where you play that's one of the very simplest or the beginning game what we use in the rehabilitation 
Now, this is in a background what I gave. Depending upon this background, we conducted a study. The first study was to establish the reliability and validity of a computer game based assessment tool for object manipulation skill in children with cerebral palsy, that is NDD. And second study we did was uh, exploratory RCT. And we took 35 children in our reliability validity study, whereas 60 children in our exploratory RCT. So in our RCT study, we studied the test retest reliability and convergent validity. Now we had, this was our inclusion and exclusion criteria, where we had GMFCS level 2 to 4 and max level 2 to 4. We did evaluate the children on minimental assessment scale and we make it sure that the children which were included are not having a cognitive deficits. They were the children who were having a mild cognitive deficit. So we included the other children who had the impairments of auditory visual systems or fixed deformities. So we had 35 children in them and max level average was 2. So if you look at the objects which we used, a few of the objects which I showed, we used four objects for that. That is peanut ball, then soccer ball, then cone, and thick plastic ring, and tennis ball. These are the objects which we used, and we did these movements analysis for the test free test reliability. And it was a fantastic results what we got, and we showed that, that in the convergent validity about the quest, you can see here, with dissociated movement, 19 of 20 possible comparisons were not significant. And with grass, 16 of 20 possible comparisons were not significant. Now you would say that it does not have a validity of a convergent validity. What I would suggest, what I would say here is that the convergent validity is not there because what Quest assesses on the five of its component, the neurofunction software evaluation does not assess that. Because Quest assesses basically the dissociated movements or grass, whereas this particular our tool assesses about the reaction time, how precise the movement was, how did the movement took the onset, and how movement variation was, which none of these assessment tools uses that. That's where the convergent validity did not have any significance with that in our study. Similar results we found with the PDMS22 also. Why? Because in PDMS2, we have a couple of objects which we use, maybe it's a a cube or sometimes a pen and a paper that's what you use so the fine motor what you are using for a manipulation task is very limited items whereas in the NFE software there are larger number of items that's why 19 out of 20 possible comparisons were not significant similar thing has happened with the visual motor scores also so what I would like to conclude here is that though we had majority of the reliability was between 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 and high observed, high minimal detectable change values which were range between 30 to 60. That was the group means. A single case study was also produced on the similar background that is a computer game assisted repetitive task practice based on based upper extremity on a single case study in a hemiparetic child. And we did get a good results in that, that baseline scores were 41 which went up to 49 and which were 87 which went up to 105 and you can see that nearly Six, the 69.4 to 92 percent that is 47.26 percent improvement we found in the children you can see here something interesting that you can see the scores which are 100 here 100 here now what does it mean is that the child has already reached the optimal level on these components so if someone says me that looking at this graph we'll say that okay child has a good function in the upper extremity but when i look at the graphs it doesn't say that my pre-intervention to post intervention there is definitely improvement but my graphs are not as smooth as they are into the normal children so it is able to pick up that small dysfunction which is still present in the hand and this child has a problem at the finger manipulations and that is why his graphs are improved no doubt about it and you saw a lot of improvement onto the quest and pdms too but here the graphs are still getting clearer and clearer. So what it says is that though your scores are higher on to the quality of assessment what you did it on PDMS and Quest, you might not have a clean graph on NFE. That means that it is sensitive enough to pick up even a small dysfunction which is remaining. From there we moved on to the, our RCT study. A protocol of the RCT study was published in a JMI International Journal. Our RCT study consists of 
45 minutes of therapy for 3 days per week for 16 weeks. We had a primary outcomes as a PDMS to inquest and secondary outcomes as our NFU or computerized hand arm assessment tool which I am talking about. We had children, all children who had NDD. We included again GMFCS max level and we used the help of, we took the help of our psychologist who helped us with an uh, evaluating on Winland social maturity scale which included, which excluded the children from cognitive deficiencies which are moderate to severe in level. So there was a multidisciplinary team working for that. And then our treatment protocol include the integration of principles of CIMT, habit, play therapy, repeated practice majors. Now you would say that here CIMT is not really forced. See the child is using one hand, that's what basically the CIMT wants to tell me that constraint induced movement therapy means I am constraining in a good hand and asking an impaired hand to be working. But what was happening in a routine therapy was that whenever I was constraining in a good hand, the child was actually getting frustrated. Similarly, the parents were also getting frustrated with this. That's what was the one which we could eliminate from this one. So these are the certain our treatment protocols and we use rehabilitation games. This is just to show you our treatment session protocol. We did a consent form and then we had an individual assessment forms which were filled like this on a daily routine basis and then each file was prepared for every child and kept it. Now just to show you what are the certain objects which you use here only I am showing you the seven objects which I have used. Now if you see at this object a bolster this is basically where we wanted to look towards the child that I wanted an, basically an elbow extension and getting a shoulder stabilizer that's where I am using an, a larger object rather than using a smaller object. But as the child develops the more and more control over proximal, I go more distal. So in this child, there isn't a good proximal control. So I am using basically a distal one where the child is manipulating a cone with the supination pronation with using the hand. Here I am going for a biomanual task where I am using a peanut ball. Here I am using a ring. Again, as I said, it depends upon the control how much I have got it. Simulation device which is basically working on to the fingers and again on a small ball for bimanual function. And when I get a good amount of control and when I wanted to use fingers, I can use a one of the object of the pegboard what we use in routine. So if you look at the pre and post graphs, you can see them, the pre graph, see the pre graph how it was very haphazard I would say, or by only seeing you can say that no this graph doesn't look really good, whereas this graph really looks good. So that's become so objectively to be quantified on this basis that pre to post there is a change. Okay. Similarly, we did the evaluation on our quantitative study that is success rate, movement error and average movement onset time. What we got the results is that we got an experimental group showed a larger improvement in success rate as well as on the average movement onset time. So basically the control group had a little lesser improvement as compared to the group which was experimental that is computer based game rehabilitation. Similarly we saw the results in Quest and PDMS2 though the, both the groups showed the significant improvement but there was larger change into the group which was experimental in nature. So that's what were the findings of our quantitative study. We did take the interview of our parents who were involved in these studies and we asked them what did they find or what was their opinion about this. What, was the, what they said was that they just like the design of CRP, every game task is designed to help the hand balance and improve the hand strength and eye coordination. See, there's a lot of demand, lot of thought that the hand and eye coordination is required for the objects. Whereas in our routine therapy, we do not pay so much of attention to this one. Whereas these parents said that, that it was a positive, that they find that their child is becoming stronger now. But one of the parents said that he's, this child was hit the computer and but then she was confined in that after a couple of months or in a month he will be able to respond and this child really responded later on. So what we would like to say that it is not an easy for a child to immediately accommodate for the therapy. It might take two or three sessions to go for it. Very important was therapist response because I said that am I kidding today? So, you might say that the therapists are thinking that I am kidding, but this is here is the response of the therapist. So, when we ask them, when you compare to the usual therapy exercise, how easy or difficult was it to implement the game exercise program? So, how did they find whether it was difficult as compared to conventional? 
so they said that it makes it boring the previous one and it was difficult to be having keeping the therapist's attention to these kids that's what they were finding but with this the game based exercise make it fun loving for children and increase their attention span so that's what we were talking about that motivation and engagement is the very important component to keep going the therapy for a longer hours and a longer period so that's what was happening here second it said that at usual program the game exercise program was easy for them to implement and it made it easier for the therapist to get the child involved in the therapy that's another important thing that you need an involvement of the therapist involvement of the child initially though it became uncomfortable for them to start it but then however after taking few session it becomes convenient and easy to use so this is what was the response on question 2 and question 3 when we asked what qualities did the computer game based intervention possess if any that made engaging and fun for the children than the conventional protocol what they said that basically the colorful and engagement of the children it was very playful to the children and it was problem solving that's very important and they said that it's a fun for the child so if you remember my title i said that that exercise rehab is a fun for the children so that's what even the therapist has to say here that yes it's a fun for the children when we asked about the recommendation for intervention of technology in your peers and colleagues most of them said yes for it and they said the reason that it's easy for implementation it's clinic as well as at home because we are looking towards that the therapy should be a continuous program and it should be carried out at home so therapist feels that it can be carried out at the home then they said the reason that working on a hand function as it is very difficult to work on each fine motor skill that's what i was trying to tell that that we as a therapist we come to the shoulder we get to the elbow but we do really get tired at the time when we reach towards the fingers and this is what the therapist has to say that each fine motor skill was difficult beginning when they were doing a conventional part but when they were using an a computer game rehab it was easy for them to be using a fine motor skills so this emphasize a lot upon a fine motor skills for the children so when we asked they said that it is basically the engaging and involving in an activity which was playful so we asked about some amount of advice to them most of them had no advice apart from small advices related to how to use the software second research exchange we had with kavisha mehta about the psychometric properties of game based intervention in balance in 30 children with cerebral palsy that is neurodevelopmental disorders and 30 age match children and we did we are doing test with this reliability this study is undergoing convergent validity and non group validities and second object second study is about exploratory rct to examine the feasibility acceptance and estimation of effectiveness of an innovative game assisted exercise program we are taking children here up to 12 years of age now what is this all content about this is an ongoing project with the collaboration we have been taking 40 children with cerebral palsy and the participants will be assigned with an uh, randomly in the experimental as well as in the control group and it's a 12 week intervention program it includes the platform which consists of miniature initial mouse which you use which you saw previously laptop pc or tablet variety of compliant surfaces for balance training like these surfaces which we call it as like an air bladder you can use this surface or you can use the foam for that purpose these are the various surfaces which can be used where we make the children to stand on that and then take their balance assessment and definitely pool of games for therapeutic purpose and we use fss software for the patient mapping now what is fss software does The FSS software is used for recording the balance capability of an individual during various activities. The participant needs to stand on this pressure mat, and therapist starts recording the foot pressure. So these are the foot pressures what the therapist is recording, and the visual analysis of the file will give us a fair idea about the various pressure and weight bearing areas of the foot. So this color one will give us the ideas about where are the pressures being exerted, and then this particular file gets evaluated. our assessment protocol includes basically the standing with eyes open then standing with eyes closed then standing and playing video motor tracking game then playing an easy cognitive game and then playing a difficult cognitive game so if you look at this particular protocol you might think of a ctsib that is clinical test for sensory interaction battery 
That's a part of it what we are using as on our protocol. So, how does there is, is there a relationship between standing balance and visual tracking? So here is an example which is explained that. So when you are standing on a normal surface, you see the balance performance. The excursion is very less. When you see the visual tracking, it's almost okay or normal. Or you can say good tracking. But when you are standing on a sponge, you see the excursion is huge on all the directions. Eyes closed so you cannot perform a visual tracking. And when you stand on a foe, you see the excursion is again larger, but you see the tracking is fair there. So what does it say is that, is that whenever you challenge the surface, your visual tracking is challenged. Similarly, your balance is challenged. So similar way, looking at the relationship between the cognitive game when you play with them. So when you play a cognitive game along with a surface which you have changed, you would see something like this. So when target only on a fixed surface, you see the excursion is smaller. When you see a target plus distractor on a fixed surface, you see the excursion is larger than this one. But when you see a target with distractor and sponge on it, you see there is a huge amount of distraction or the huge amount of excursion which is happening in all the directions. So which again proves that a cognitive added to the balance has a lot of influence on balance. That's why dual task plays an important role when you want to improve the balance in children with cerebral palsy. So, we, did, we are conducting the similar study that is effectiveness of computer-aided rehabilitation versus conventional physiotherapy treatment for balance in children with neurodevelopmental disorder and exploratory randomized controlled trial. This is an ongoing trial. This is how our protocol is documented. And what we do in this is we try to make the child with keeping on a mouse on the head and then the child plays the game and here if you see here he is in a surface which is changed it's a tilt board on which the child is standing so the surface challenge plus cognitive challenge so the child is doing a dual task in here and interacting with that computer game so while doing so it's challenging the balance and that's what is an hypothesis that it improves the balance so if you look at the initial reports or initial results on PDMS2, we did almost finish, nearly finished five or six of them and ten of them are ongoing. You can see the gain is into the experimental group is in, that S is for stationary component of the PDMS2 and L is for locomotion component of PDMS2. You can see that gain is 6, 4 up to 40 and only in one children there is no much gain as him occurred. But otherwise, if you see all the children, there is a large gain which has occurred, which has gone up to 16 in locomotion and 14 in stationary. So stationary is the where the body is stable and locomotion where the body is in movement. So what it says is that dual task will improve your gait also, that is your locomotion also. When you look at these PDMS2 scores into the control group, look at the gain. Almost there is no much gain into the conventional group, though there is a one of the client improved almost up to 12. Otherwise, all the children you can see, there is no much gain has occurred post-intervention. We did take a pediatric per balance scale and you can see the gain in the control group as well as in the experimental group. Experimental group you can see a minimum up to 4 which has gone up to 12 whereas into the control group it's no gain or maximum is 4 gain. So, the primary result shows that, that dual tasking or having this particular cognitive based rehabilitation including into the game based rehabilitation improves the balance of the children. And this is how the pressure map data looks like that the result clearly states that there are improvements in the total path length values from pre to post 8 weeks in both the groups and especially more into the experimental group and when compared pre to post 8 week result concluded that post results were better. So we are into the continuation of this particular study and not yet completed. Let's hear to the parents what they wanted to say about this particular thing. I'm Alize Rukri's mother. We have been coming here for Siddha physiotherapy sessions since back 2019. Uh, we came here because she had developmental delays due to which she could not uh, sit without support crawl and also she was not able to do uh, much things which babies normally do. Uh, so once her physiotherapy session started, she started gaining her strength 
due to which she started uh, sitting without support and she is now able to crawl she speaks very clearly also and she walks without uh, uh, without support for few steps and with minimal support she walks very nicely uh, along with this the based using the computer based rehabilitation her balance has improved and she is uh, weight bearing on her legs very very uh, nicely uh, this all has happened because of uh, very good support from all the uh, doctors uh, under, under the guidance of uh, dr sanjay who keeps an eye on uh, her uh, and monitors time to time so that's what the parent has to say. We have a couple of uh, another studies developed that is development of hand function rehabilitation platform for children with cerebral palsy, acquired brain injuries. We took 50 children with CP and 50 healthy children to form the normatives and we used cone, ring, tennis ball and fork as an object manipulation. So that's how it looks like when we did a tracking mode. Now you see here a healthy child is having a good tracking whereas the child with hemiplegia has a distorted tracking here. So what is this tells about that see these are the different objects and this is about the tracking or what we use. Now what does it say that most of the time though the child is having you know, visual issues because of which he has a poor postural control which is getting usually ignored. But this graph clearly says that that the children with hemiplegia for example has many issues with the tracking that means visual issues. So this can be sorted out when you use these computer based game rehabilitation protocols because you need to have a visual as well as the motor that is eye hand coordinations for that. And you can see how does the healthy child performance was versus the child with cerebral palsy. You can see the graph which is very neat and clean versus a graph which is very distorted in children with cerebral palsy. And when we did the with the comparison with the normal children, we got on surprising results that was the significant difference in all four outcome measures in the control group and children with max 1 level means what does it says is that you say that the max level 1 is almost to the normal but in our case max level 1 also showed the difference as compared to the normal children though there was a difference between cerebral palsy and the normal children at all the levels that is success rate and movement error but surprisingly max level 1 also had the difference between the uh, normal as well as the max level 1 so that says that this tool is particularly maybe able to take out a very sensitive or very deficient and very remaining part of the component of the dysfunction also which the max on grossly when we evaluate and say max 1 may not be able to pick it up that. So you might say that I might have to revise about it but yes then that's what was our finding of the this normal children and the children with cerebral palsies. Now we are doing one of the pilot, rehabilit pilot study on tele rehabilitation. As you saw, the therapist also said that it should be a carryover towards the home. So we have been recruited now total six children here, of which three we have completed and three are recruited in Canada, Winnipeg. So this is what is our tele rehab protocol looks like. Now if you look at the results of this one, you can see that the success rate which was 46.7%, 47% in the beginning, went up to 70.59%. And this is what is happening at home and we are doing in a telemonitoring. You can see that the movement error is also which was 0.46 reduced to 0.09. So there is a change which is offering in the children in the initial stage what we are monitoring them. Similar findings with the PDMS2 and Quest, you can see that pre was 50 which got up to 52 into the PDMS, the maximum score over here is 54 to 56 actually. So there is a good range of change which has occurred. Similarly, you can see the changes which has happened between protecting, for example, in Quest also at all the levels of pre versus post. Though you can see that the similar thing here, the child has already reached to the plateau over here. So no much changes, but you can see in the grass that 94 has gone up to 96% of change. I mean, sorry, that's a 96.29% of changes. So, do you still think that that rehab exercise for children with cerebral palsy is fun or you think that still I am kidding about it? I would say that rehab exercises for children with cerebral palsy is fun and I am not kidding about it. 
This particular work of computer game based rehabilitation did not limit it to the only SDM College of Physical Therapy. We conducted a lot of workshops, guest lectures, talks at various conferences. These are the glimpses what I am trying to show you that we had almost nearly 50 participants which we conducted, one at the Kasturba Medical College, one we conducted at the national level that is National Conference for Physical Therapists and one was at the Potential Change for Children with Cerebral Palsy, one we conducted at Kesho Seva Sadhana School in Goa. We conducted the same into the National Physiotherapy Conclave which was supported by the government that is Ministry of Ayush. We conducted that on one of the National Conference of Common Health Association for Health and Disability in India 2019. We, can, we also gave a lot of talk into the postgraduate conferences and into the regional conferences and regional workshops and lectures at the different colleges and we had got a couple of awards for the same when the, our students have presented on the similar topic. And we do have on a Facebook page which is promoting about what is all about the neurofunctioning gaming and how it is useful for physios and occupational therapists. Along with that, everyone has some contribution to be done towards the upliftment of the profession. As a physical therapist, I am. In India, there is a struggle which is going on for the development of the council. So, I was one of the members in a parliamentary standing committee on health and family welfare, Rajya Sabha Secretariat, where I presented the views on bill of the Physiotherapy Council bill. This is along with the Honorable Minister of Parliamentary Affairs, that is Sri Prahlad Joshi ji. And this is when we went to the Rajya Sabha, that is at the standing committee Rajya Sabha, Government of India with Sri Ram Gopal Yadav ji, who heard our concerns about the Physiotherapy Council and shortly we will have a Physiotherapy Council for the country. From here, I would like to move towards what future research I am looking for or for, for few, what future collaboration research we are looking for. We are looking for a treadmill instrumented with pressure mapping system which is looking to be giving us the, all the details about the gate variabilities when we are doing in a dual task that is walking as well as playing in a computer game and it gives the pressure mat is embedded into the treadmill and then it gives them a good data about the gate variables and also about the MPA that is medial lateral as well as anterior posterior center of pressure excursions. That's what we are looking for. We are looking for this one of the wonderful instrument which is called as manipulandum. This is a modular computer controlled rehabilitation platform which operates to be assistive as well as resistive in finger, thumb extension, flexion and three wrist motions while performing broad range of goal directed object manipulation tasks. So we are looking towards this particular study along with Dr. Tony and his team which gives a wide variety of objects to be used for manipulation. So this one would give us a lots of variety to be using for the hand function to improve that includes the thumb, fingers, lumbricals, thinar and hypothenar musculatures to be worked upon with the various degrees of wrist movements to be done. So here is a small video about the same. Uh, maybe try and hold it like with your fingers and manipulate. So you can see here the manipulation with the fingers. You can see here the manipulation with the wrist which is going on. And it gives so an assistive and resistive movements and both. Assistance on one side or assistance and assistance both. Also, we are into the thinking that we have done a lot of studies on to the ground based interventions and we do have on a hydrotherapy pool. So, we would like to look into how technology is playing because that's where the world is moving today. So I am interested or keen to know what comparative studies if we do on land based versus water and technology and which one would show on a better influence in outcome. That's what I am looking for in future. And definitely we are into the process of developing a multi-center randomized control trial in computer game rehabilitations where we are going to involve three to four centers to collect the data and see how effective this tool is what we have found it effectiveness into that. My another area of concern and research as we are all aware that autism is in rise. So we wanted to develop some screening tool which is easy to administer which should be also on a digital base because we do have a lot many on qualitative base and also finding out the role of treatment strategies for developing the protocol which would be having an a 
digital implications on that. Also, I wanted to look towards early intervention and role of technology. In early intervention, we talked a lot of about the positioning, kangaroo care and all those. We have not been invented about what technology can play a role in early intervention with children. The biggest question which is a social for me and for probably for the entire universe or world is that one of the parents, one of the family came to me with the children with disability and asked me that, Sir, I am there, I can take care of my child now. I can make him movable. But once the child is movable with some amount of deformities and if, and if I am not there, who is the one who will take care of this child? So that's probably the biggest social question which every country is facing and how to take care of them. And I am really looking towards what best can be done for the children with neurodevelopmental disorder, which can be taken care for them for a lifetime and not only monitoring them for a period of time where they become ambulating. Looking towards them as an adolescent, looking towards them as a geriatric population, how they would grow and how we can support them. So, with this, if you have any queries, you can post me on my email ID or you can post to Dr. Tony on his email ID. We will be happy to share or to answer your queries, if any, on this particular topic. So with this, I would like to thank the University of Manitoba, Dr. Tony and his team and my university, that is Sri Dharmasthala Manjunathishwara University, full administrative team, my postgraduate student team. And I would like to say that not to keep only a physical health, but we do need a brain health. And that brain health is nothing but a neuronal fitness. And while having a neuronal fitness, you should have a fun while doing that. And what I learned from this collaboration is that alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And definitely, if hands are close together, the child can rest with a peace that yes, there is someone who is going to take care of me. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thanks a lot.